time and day, we look up into the sky. We bring you exclusive footage from eclipses worldwide. We take our mobile observatory to where the action happens. Hi, Stefan. Hi, Anna. We collaborate with experts and observatories across the globe to bring you the best view of celestial events. And we ordered the devil's horn just for you. Now, we have to say thank you very much for your images tonight. We explain how and show why it all happens while answering your questions during our live broadcast events. That is a, a meteor. Find your home and even more details on time and day. And subscribe to join us next time. And we are back. We were here two weeks ago streaming a total, no, a partial solar eclipse. I'm Anna Buckle. This is Graham Jones. And we're here for a total lunar eclipse tonight from the Time and Date Studio in Stavanger, Norway. Next four hours, we're going to be looking at a total lunar eclipse. We're in for an hour and 25 minutes of glorious totality. So, Graham, what are we in for? Yes, Anna, as you say, tonight we have a total lunar eclipse. Um, the eclipse started about an hour ago mm -hmm. with the penumbral phase of the eclipse. This is where the moon starts moving through the light outer part of Earth's shadow. The partial phase of the eclipse, where the moon uh, starts uh, entering the Earth's umbra, the darker inner part of the Earth's shadow, that is starting in around about four minutes mm. from now. On mm. the left-hand side of our screen, we have the timeline showing mm. the various stages of tonight's eclipse. And in the bottom right corner of the screen, we have the UTC clock mm. showing the time right now. At the moment, in the middle of the screen, we have uh, these glorious mm. pictures coming in from the time and date mobile observatory in tucson arizona yeah. uh, the full moon is looking magnificent there and we can see the earth's dark shadow is starting to approach the top of the mm. moon as we see it on the screen so um yes as you say we have about an hour and 25 minutes of totality yeah. coming up in tonight's eclipse and uh we have telescopes lined up across the globe yep. uh, to capture this event. Um, I think we can bring up a map with, uh, with, with our stream locations for tonight's mm -hmm. eclipse. We've got locations across North America, the Pacific, and Australia. Uh, so uh, we've already mentioned the time and date mobile observatory mm. in Tucson, Arizona. Um, we have two feeds coming in from Hawaii, uh, we've got Ichi Tanaka and his team at the Subaru Asahi Star Camera. Um, and we have uh, Preeti Krishnamurthy and Avinash Surendran, um, who are the starry knights. Um, they have got their telescopes set up in Waimea, mm. Hawaii. Mm. Um, we have moonrise coming up tonight uh, in Western Australia. Yeah. Um, we are again collaborating with Matt Woods, at Perth Observatory mm -hmm. and at around about 10.43 UTC, um, we uh, should be seeing the moon rising in Perth. As always, of course, mm. dependent on the weather, there are some clouds around in Western Australia at the moment. So fingers crossed for our feed from Perth. Um, we also have uh, a feed coming in from New York. Yeah. Uh, this is from Katrosh at the Amateur Astronomers Association. Um, at the moment, we have beautifully clear skies Lucky in New York. Cat. Absolutely. And, um, and one thing to look forward to in New York, around about 10.30 UTC. Um, UTC clock right below us. That's it. Um, around about 10.30 UTC, we, uh, we might start to see the moon moving behind the Manhattan skyline as we, as we move towards moonset on the east coast of the United States. So we have 
uh, a lot to look forward to. Tonight. There's a lot coming up, but what is not coming up, unfortunately, are our friends Dave Decker and Gary Hawkins from the San Diego Astronomy Association. They were supposed to be streaming with us for the fifth time. This is the first time they've been completely clouded out and not been able to send us any images. We were supposed to be in Roswell with the Mobile Observatory. We couldn't stay there. There were clouds, so we sent the Mobile Observatory west to Tucson, Arizona, and we're happy about that. We're looking at some gorgeous images of the moon here. But Roswell, we're going to go back. There's an annular eclipse next year, so that's why we were trying to do it from there. So we'll see if the clouds stay away for that. Um, also coming up, we've got an interview with our friend Matt in Perth. We've got Peggy Berlin in Roswell. We've got our mobile observatory in Arizona. And in about half an hour from now, we're going to be talking to lunar scientist Noah Petro from NASA. So stay with us. Be sure to have a look at Time and Date Talk live we've got all fun things happening there with information behind the scenes about our partners tweets of people watching the eclipse from where they are so stay with us and we'll be back here soon
and here we are again and we're looking at some gorgeous images from tucson arizona that's the time and date mobile observatory there bringing us those pictures we've got some live images from waimea hawaii that's the starry nights uh sending us those gorgeous images there and then we've got this beautiful image coming in from new york we can see that earth's darker inner shadow is eating away at all these different aspects of the moon, Graham, why do they look different? Right, so the partial phase of this eclipse started about 13 minutes ago, and all of our stream locations are watching the same eclipse happen at the same time. Mm. Um, one of the differences is uh, that all our locations have different local times. It's mm. different times of the night, yeah. so the moon is in a different place in the sky. Um, in in Hawaii, for example, uh, the local time right now is uh, is is about twenty past eleven um, in the evening on the Monday. Mm -hmm. um, so we're coming up to midnight, and the moon is pretty much overhead in Hawaii. Um, in Tucson um, and in New York, we're into Tuesday morning. In Tucson, it's about two twenty in the morning in new york it's 4 20 in the morning yep. we're heading towards the end of night the moon is heading towards moonset so the moon's in a different part of the sky and the orientation of the moon as we see it in the mm. sky is is changing mm. another thing we should mention yep. anna is that everybody's using different equipment yep. different telescopes different setups different zoom levels and that gives us a very different image of the moon yeah. as well different sizes different colors different shadings and telescopes can also flip the image of the moon yeah. some telescopes can flip it top to bottom others left to right um, our feed coming in from new york for example that's uh, in fact a flipped image of the moon left to right mm. if you were looking at this partial eclipse in new york in the sky right now then you would actually see that dark bite of the Earth's shadow on the other side of mm. the moon. So basically we're all looking at the same moon, but it's at different times in the sky, which changes the aspect. And then we've got equipment that also can flip the whole image and make it look like the dark side's coming from, from the other side. Right, Yeah. right. Yeah, we've got our lovely timeline here because everybody who is on the night side of Earth can see a total lunar eclipse. So if it's dark outside, you can go outside, you can see this eclipse. And as you can see from our timeline there, that is a really good, like handy countdown for us to use. Um, the penumbral phase is already done, the first penumbral phase, and we're mm, almost a third into the partial phase of this eclipse. Um, totality? less than an hour to go you can see the utc time right below us here that's easy to use with the timeline there the moon is going to be eaten away by earth's umbra it's dark in a shadow and you're going to see pictures of it right here for the next four almost four hours we've already started the show so we've got we've eaten into those four hours as well but who can see it graham Right. So that's that's the big question. Of course, you can enjoy mm. our stream here on time and date. Um, but who can go outside mm. and see it in mm. the sky tonight? Um, well, as you said, Anna, a lunar eclipse is visible from anywhere on the nighttime side yeah. of the Earth. This is a, a full moon. Mm. A full moon is on the opposite side of Earth mm. to the sun. So uh, when the sun sets, the full moon rises um, and the full moon is up all night. We can go and take a look at our time and date moonlight world map uh, to have a look at who can see the moon in the sky at the moment. Um, so uh, this is our moonlight world map. The globe is divided into two. Um, the, the moon is over the Pacific mm. at the moment, more or less directly above Hawaii, mm. as we were saying. So anyone on that side of the earth can see the moon in the sky. On the other side of the globe, we can just see the sun is uh, overhead uh, over Southern Africa at the moment. That's the daytime side of the earth. We, this is a moonlight world mm. map. So on this map, the light area is, is where you can see the moon and the dark area is the daytime side of the mm. globe where you can see the sun. So, um, 
we can see from from this map that um, right now anyone in North America, mm -hmm. um, it's it's nighttime. You can go outside and and have a look at this eclipse. Um, the western half of South America and uh, the eastern part of Asia, the eastern half of Australia and mm -hmm. New Zealand. Um, this eclipse is overhead at the moment. One thing course to mention that the earth is rotating so over the next few hours this moonlight world map uh, will change mm. and the moon will shift to the west so we will have moonset during this eclipse mm -hmm. over the eastern half of north america and we will have moonrise over asia and over the the western part of australia including our stream location in in perth yeah in western australia um so uh yes we I, I, again looking at the timeline mm. we still have many hours to go mm. on this eclipse um so as the moon rises locations in australia and asia will see this eclipse at moonrise yeah and we're going to show you it from start to finish um so stay with us. We're going to be back in about 10 minutes. So we're going to be talking to Noah Petro. He's a lunar scientist at NASA, and he's going to explain about the Artemis One mission. And it's scheduled to blast off the moon to the moon next Monday. So um, let's hope that it's going to go. It's rocket science after all. So we know there's a lot of things that have to be in place. In the meantime, go to timeanddead.live for more information about uh, this eclipse. And we'll see you soon.
Welcome back. Uh, we are watching this total lunar eclipse on time and date. Uh, we have three spectacular views of the moon on the screen at the moment. In our main screen, we have the view from Tucson, Arizona, from our time and date mobile observatory. The moon is getting eaten away mm. by the Earth's mm. dark umbral shadow. We're about half an hour from totality. That's when the entire moon will be covered by the Earth's dark shadow, and it will take on that famous reddish tint. Mm. Um, in the on the right hand side of our screen, we have uh, our two feeds from Hawaii. Um, Anna, this is the third time mm. that we've worked with our collaborators in Hawaii. Um, at the top there, we have the stream coming in from Waimea on the on the Big Island mm. of Hawaii. This is coming from Preeti Krishnamurthy and Avinash Surendran, who are also known as the the starry nights, and uh, they've got their telescope set up on the beach in Waimea. And uh, we hear they're having to contend with big gusts of wind yeah. uh, there uh, down by the ocean, um, but they're giving us uh, beautiful images. Fairly stable view still, so they must have been weighing down that telescope or something. Exactly, they? exactly. Yes, mm. yes. Uh, also from Hawaii, and also the third time mm. we've worked with them, um, from uh, Ichi Tanaka and the team at the Subaru Asahi Star Camera. Mm. That's the other picture we've got there from Hawaii. Um, this is a camera that is on the top of Mauna Kea, mm. a big volcano in the center of, of Hawaii's big island. Um, it's positioned next to the Subaru Telescope. And if you look very carefully, on the right hand side of the mm. picture coming in from Mauna Kea, you can just see the dome mm. of the Subaru telescope um, there at the top of this volcano. Mm. And uh, yes, we're getting this beautiful wide angle image of the sky there. Because the moon Hawaii. is really overhead, right? In Hawaii, we, we were looking at that map and we were looking at the moon being very overhead Hawaii. That's right. So uh, on our picture there, it looks like the, the dome of the observatory is kind of on its side mm. because the camera is having to point straight mm. up because, yes, as we saw, the moon is directly overhead mm. the, the middle of the Pacific right now. Yep. And now we're going to welcome Noah Petra to the show. Noah is the project scientist for NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Mission. Oh, that's a mouthful, but I managed to do it. He's also a great lunar enthusiast or a lunatic, as we like to call them over here. And uh, welcome to us, Noah. Well, thank you for having me on. And I hate that my, my camera is covering over another picture of the moon, but I'll try to <laughs> make up for it, I guess. You were just telling us in the break that you were pretty stunned. It's it's early morning uh, for you, so um, mm -hmm. you have to wake up. But but I think you had a bit of a wake up call, didn't you? Oh yeah, I, I you know I crept downstairs. Don't want to wake up anybody else in my house. Walked outside, and at first, you know, there's I have an instinct, like you said, to look straight up to look for the moon, and I couldn't see it. What's going on? And very low on the horizon here in Washington, D.C. is the moon. And with this beautiful slice taken out of it, I was speechless, which is not great for talking <laughs> to all of you at 4.50 in the morning. But we'll, we'll, we'll trundle through it. <laughs> but we're about half an hour from totality. And what can people expect to see? I, I mean, golly, uh, you know, when we get to totality, and this is actually the before and after reaching totality are really interesting because right now you can see there's a significant mm -hmm. portion of the moon that is still illuminated by the sun. And so that is so bright that your eyes basically can only see that. But the moment that the sun, I'm sorry, the, the moon completely passes into the Earth's shadow mm -hmm. and there's no more direct sunlight reaching the, the lunar surface, you will see the moon effectively transition to this rusty orange reddish color uh, which is every sunrise and every sunset getting projected onto the lunar surface so there will be this i was going to say miraculous it's not a miracle it's physics <laughs> there will be this transition 
at totality. And I mean, if if my reaction ten minutes ago of of stunned silence is anything, that that moment will will equally be stunning. And what's the best way to enjoy a lunar eclipse? Do you think? Well, apart from watching along with all of us here on time and date, mm. I think that the, the best way is to be, first of all, at a very lucky spot that can see it. So whether you're in yeah. D.C. or in Hawaii um, and with clear skies, I, I think the other important thing is to, to be in a place that is, is very free of, of light pollution. Unfortunately, mm. we can't always control that. You know, I, I did not go around in my neighborhood last night reminding people to turn their lights off at night. So there's a few, <laughs> you know, exterior lights on. But if you have a place that's very dim with few mm. obstructions, pretty soon here, we're going to be battling the, the moon being behind trees and buildings. And so mm. uh, if you have a clear spot where you have a view of the horizon, an unobstructed view of the horizon, I think you'll be in good, good luck. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Noah, you're the project scientist for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission. Um, this has been um, orbiting the moon and sending back reams of data since 2009. Um, th th what is it that we are still learning and finding out about the moon? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we, we've been at the moon for over 13 years. We're supposed to last no more than two years. So hmm. it's far too early in the morning to do the math on that. But what we have effectively shown is that um, the moon is dynamic. We've always known that the moon has moon quakes, ever since Apollo, at least we've known that. But now we're able to, with our high resolution camera and the other sensors on LRO, detect new features that have formed on the lunar surface, specifically new impact craters. So by measuring the, the amount of change over 13 years, we can predict well, what's going to happen over 10,000 years or a million years and basically use this very small uh, observation window that we currently have and say, well, if, if this is the rate at which new impact craters are forming, well, by gosh, the, the, the moon's surface is, is turning over, is turning much faster than we expected based on pre-LRO observations. And so what we're able to do is take what used to be considered a static moon and say, well, here's how static it actually is. When we understand the moon, we can say, well, it must be like this on Mercury or on an asteroid or on Pluto and take our understanding mm. and extend it across the solar system. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Of course, one of the big moon stories at the moment uh, is, uh, is the Artemis program. Um, Artemis one is scheduled to blast off for the moon uh, next Monday. Um, the, why, why are we going back to the moon with Artemis? Well, I, you have to forgive me for every once in a while for turning my head. I'm trying to orient myself <laughs> so I can figure out what we're seeing in the picture there. Um, with Artemis, we are building on the legacy of not just LRO, uh, which is, again, beginning to change our understanding of the, the moon and its environment, but of course of, of Apollo as well. By exploring the, the moon, we hope, well, first of all, find volatiles, water that we could use to sustain a, an extended presence at the lunar surface. What we want Artemis to be is not just Apollo 2.0. What we want to do is take the lessons from Apollo, build on it, and extend the time that we're at the lunar surface, not just from three days to six days, but from six days to weeks to months, to have a sustained presence of humans on the lunar surface, learning how to live on another planetary body. Why do we wanna learn how to live on another planetary body? Well, we wanna to go to Mars. So to do that safely and successfully, we have to learn how to live off of our planet. And in my humble opinion, the next best place to do that is off of the moon. And of course, where we go for the moon, the South Pole of the moon has an incredibly dynamic environment. We know that some of the coldest temperatures in the solar system are found deep within craters that receive no direct sunlight. We know that there's volatiles at the surface of the South Pole. We know that there are ancient rocks that can reveal the cratering history of the early solar system. So you know, to think of our exploration of the South Pole by Artemis as being a bit of a time machine. We're gonna be taken back to processes, events that were happening over 4 billion years ago, as well as what's happening today 
even though right now a portion of the moon is being blocked from the sun, normally we have the beautiful solar rays and solar energy hitting the lunar surface. And so learning what happens when you know that process is going on um, is, is really important. So Artemis will give us this opportunity to learn about ancient past, the present, and then apply that to understanding what is going to happen to the Earth, to the solar system in the future as well. Wow. Well, that's a lot. But to take things back to tonight's <laughs> eclipse, <laughs> because yeah. it's happening right now, you're tilting your head looking at it. Uh, what can we learn yeah. from a lunar eclipse? So uh, I want to ask all of the viewers to think about what's actually happening to the lunar surface. So imagine you're standing mm -hmm. at the Apollo 11 landing site, which is now completely engulfed in the, in the Earth's shadow. So you would have been standing there. It would have been midday, nice hot day at just, tranquility base and then all of a sudden the sun starts dimming so not only is it getting uh dimmer the, the sun is is is, is 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 fading behind the earth it's also cooling if you've ever been to a beach on a, on a very hot day you know the sand is, gets really hot but maybe you're standing on a large rock or you have boulders you can stand on those stay cooler well we know that the, the moon's surface reacts to to temperature and normally there's 14 and a half days of, of sunlight and 14 and a half days of darkness for for most of the moon certainly for the apollo landing sites but when the sun disappears behind the earth it cools very rapidly like a cloud passing in front of the the sun uh, when you're on the beach and so what we've been able to do from from orbit in previous eclipses although we're not doing that uh, this experiment with this eclipse and from Earth-based assets is actually measure that temperature change during an eclipse, that drastic temperature change. And depending on the properties of the surface, how fine-grained the material is or how blocky the material is, that cooling and heating uh, curve during the eclipse of the surface mm -hmm. uh, can be different. So we can actually learn about some of the physical properties of the surface of the moon by watching those cooling curves during eclipses. Uh, the diviner instrument on LRO has, has made those types of experiments, those types of measurements before, you know, normally it's measuring that normal 14 and a half day mm. cooling and heating cycle during, uh, during the lunar day. Um, but from earth, we can do that obviously for near side targets and, uh, gain some insight into, uh, to the surface of the moon. Wow. I th I'm amazed that you can talk about all these really complicated things so early in the morning, but it's super interesting. So basically it's, it's, it's day in, day and night, instead of it having 14 and a half hours of days of day and 14 and a half days night, you've got, you've got it just in a short period of time. It cools off very rapidly. It's like mm. taking something straight from an oven and putting it in the freezer. And so measuring how it rapidly it cools can tell you about the, the, the properties of, of the surface. And um, again, imagine you're standing on the lunar surface, you're tending to your lunar, when the sun starts disappearing, it's going to rapidly cool down wow. because that energy source, the sun has just disappeared. Now in a couple hours, it will come back and it will heat right back up just as rapidly. You don't have that normal the sun sets and fades mm. very gradually um, when you you uh, when you get sunset on, on this or sunrise on the moon. So this is again a unique configuration uh, that we get uh, with these eclipses and becomes a, an opportunity to learn something. Wow, well that's super interesting, Noah. And thank you so much for joining his, us here in the show. And we're going to bring on Matt Woods in Perth when we come back. But in between that, check out Time and Date Live. We've got more information about eclipses. We've got images, tweets, background information. And while you're in there, hit subscribe to YouTube. We've got a lot of live, live eclipse shows coming up in the future. So uh, we'll be back soon.
Welcome back to Time and Date. We are watching a lunar eclipse. And uh, for the past hour or so, the Earth's dark shadow has been eating its way across 
the face of the moon, turning it darker and darker. And now we are just a few minutes away from the start of totality, mm. when the whole of the moon is covered by Earth's dark shadow. And that's when it takes on this, this famous blood red mm. color. We can already see it here on the screen. Right. So on the screen at the moment, we've got three different views of this eclipse. On the big screen there, we have uh, from Waimea in Hawaii, we have a moon that does look like a like a reddish, orangeyish blood moon. In the top right corner from the Time and Date Mobile Observatory um, in Tucson, Arizona, we have the same view of the same stage of the eclipse, but we've got different settings here. Because when we come from this transition from the partial phase of the eclipse to the total phase of the eclipse, the brightness of the moon changes. So that edge of the moon, which is still in sunlight, mm. that is still extremely bright. The side of the moon that's completely covered by the Earth's shadow is, is much darker. Mm. So in our feed in the top right corner from Tucson, we have the settings uh, uh, set to pick out that sort of crescent bright edge to the moon. In our main feed uh, on the main screen from, uh, from Waimea, um, there, the settings have been adjusted to pick up that reddish color of the moon's disk. So we're looking at the same event, the same eclipse at the same time, but different settings are giving us different views of either the brighter edge of the moon or the darker, more reddish tint of the of the lunar disk. Yeah, yeah. And we're about half an hour away from moonrise in Perth, right at the start, we were talking about how the, the moon would set uh, in the east, but it would also rise in the west. And we're going to be talk to, talking to our partner, Matt Woods at Perth Observatory. And we've worked with him five times already. He keeps coming back and we love him for it. it first time we worked with him was in 2018. So we're going to get Matt on here with us. Hello, Matt. How are you? Hey, how you doing? <laughs> how you doing? It's quite bright. Yeah, it's quite bright where you are. Yeah, yeah. We're we're coming up to sunset now, so yeah. <laughs> so it's, and where are you, and and who's there with you? Yeah. Well, we've got all our Perth Observatory volunteers. So you saw one behind me beforehand, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but yeah, we're having a unfortunately because it's uh right the moon's rising about 14 minutes before maximum totality we have a whole set of trees around the observatory so we've had to leave the comfort of our observatory which is currently under a lot of cloud at the moment and come to matilda bay so we're actually on the western side of perth and we're looking back towards uh perth C cbd in west yeah, australia yeah we can see it right above you there we've got this your beautiful view there and uh, i can see you've got some clouds there in the horizon yes yeah and yes that's that they're called our mortal enemy but we did actually have some dolphins <laughs> beforehand here so so there was a lot of a lot of the kids were really really interested in that as well so yeah <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's, it's great to see you there with the team from Perth Observatory, Matt. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work that goes on at Perth Observatory? Yeah, so Perth Observatory was actually started in 1896 and we actually created West Australian Standard Time. And uh, so we were supposed we were one of the big things we were supposed to do was astronomical research so we were part of the Carter seal project at the very beginning to map the entire southern sky as well as the northern hemisphere uh, and also just to be able to train surveyors and navigators plus uh, control the time for west australia as australia got close to federation uh, but some of the in more interesting stuff we've done later on uh, we've actually we co-discovered the rings of Uranus. So we, we made yeah. that joke slightly dirtier. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we did actually a lot of work with um, Comet Halley back in 1986. So unfortunately, I'm a month old when Comet Halley came into the inner solar system. So I'm going to have to wait till 2061 to see it. But uh, we, we narrowed down the rotational 
uh, rotation of the comet to about 24 hours, uh, 20 to 24 hours. And uh, they also found cyogen uh, jets on Comet Halley as well, which is actually a component of tear gas. So that's fairly wow. interesting. And uh, we, you know, we've done a lot of We've done a lot of asteroid searches. We found exoplanets as well. Since 2015, the volunteer group that was set up in 2000, 1996 to help the astronomers run the night sky tours, we've actually run the observatory. So the mental uh, patients have full control of the asylum. And uh, it's been great. We've been able to just to really get the, get the West Australian public into space and astronomy. And like we are, we've coming out of COVID, the first lockdown we had here, we we've been about three months booked out of our night sky tours. So it's uh, with with the international borders reopening uh, this year for West Australia, the problem wasn't getting customers. To, it was trying to create <laughs> spots for the international and interstate people. So it's um, and it's such a big state, like you know. You can go down to the bottom West Australia and it's old English country and you can go up to the top and you're dealing with desert, red dirt that looks like you know, you're on Mars. Uh, so, yeah, like uh, Roger, who's helping me t uh, tonight, uh, we were at his property in the central wheat belt and doing a workshop for an Orionids two weeks ago and we got Aurora. <laughs> so we were able to get a time lapse wow. of Aurora as well. So, yeah. Uh, not as good as what you guys get in Norway. You know, we're slightly, <laughs> slightly higher on the world. So, but you know, the southern hemisphere has all the best objects. So, I suppose we have to give the northern hemisphere some, something. So, just, just a little bit there, just a little bit for the northern hemisphere. Yeah. But yeah. it's all happening in the southern hemisphere because there's a total solar eclipse happening in April. And what are your plans, Matt? Yeah, so we're be heading up there to Exmouth. Uh, so we're, we're probably leaving about a week beforehand and we're going to be doing some astronomy nights while we're up there uh, going along the way. So we're going to be at the Kalis Brothers site. So this is about half an hour south of, uh, of Exmouth. So we get about 56 seconds of the actual total solar eclipse. So it's pretty cool because this one's actually hybrid eclipse which doesn't usually happen over land no. so but this is i think the first first solar total solar eclipse of about three that happens over 30 years over west that west australia gets so i think wow. the next one's about 2028 so <laughs> yeah so um I, I i actually i was up close to Exmouth in september i was in uh we got up as far as coral bay uh, it was very hard to leave Coral Bay. There's a nice, there's a reef there called the Ningaloo Reef. So uh, yeah. we got there a little bit early and got to snorkel that. And that's, it's a pretty, wow. it, you know, it's a pretty amazing spot. So, uh, but yeah, X, X Mouth is definitely going to be pretty cool to be there. And uh, it's a small town. It's about 70, uh, to, was it 2,000, 3,000. So it's probably a little bit like Madras in Oregon for the uh, Great uh, American Solar Eclipse. So uh, they've been, they've started to really, you know, get ready for maybe ten to 50,000 people to arrive. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, uh, yes, that really is something <laughs> that we're getting excited about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For next getting year. Worked up. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and don't, and, and don't uh, worry. We'll, we'll look at, we'll look after St uh, Stefan when he gets here really well. So <laughs> we'll get, we'll get him back to you in one piece. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's great. Yes, we've got we've got time and dates. Very own Stefan Torsen will yeah. be coming and joining you. So yes, thank you for thank you for looking after him <laughs> there. And um, no worries. We'll, hey, we'll, Matt, we'll make his trip to Sandorini a few years ago. Uh, you know, it seemed minuscule to what we can what, <laughs> what, what, what we can do with him here. Well, that's terrific. And hey, Matt, thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, uh, for talking to us uh, this evening. So um, uh, we can see you've got the sun setting behind you there and um, and then looking yeah. looking towards the east. Um, we're, we're what? We're about 25 minutes from moonrise, but it's going to take a while for the moon to clear those clouds on the horizon. Yeah, I, I don't know whether we're going to be able to see totality, but we should probably be able to get uh, the the second partial phase. So, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how we go. Um, 
it's just going to be a shame because this is going to be the last total so, uh, lunar eclipse that we're going to get till about two th- September 2025. So. Yeah I'll, yeah, I'll have to savor this live streaming because we won't be live streaming a uh, total solar eclipse for you till then. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, hey, Matt, really, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you to you and all your colleagues there at Perth Observatory for uh, standing by and ready, being ready to send us images once the moon has risen and once it's up above the clouds. To recap, oh, and thank thank you to the technology gods for uh, for giving us reliable internet at the moment. So that's a big thing <laughs> here in Australia. So, well, exactly. Yes, yes. So, Roger, say recap. I'm jinxing it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, hey, we are about eight minutes into the total phase of this eclipse we have around about an hour and 20 minutes of totality to come we have a beautiful image of the red tinted moon on our main screen there coming from the time and date mobile observatory Mm. in tucson arizona um so sit back relax enjoy and enjoy the view um keep an eye on time and date dot live where we have uh, pictures from around the world of the event as it's happening. And uh, Anna and I will be back with you very shortly. Just as the moon is rising in Perth, we're also heading towards the moon setting behind the skyline from our feed in New York. Mm. Uh, So that is the next highlight coming up. So stick with us on time and date, and we will be back with you very soon.
you're watching time and day and we are watching a total lunar eclipse and we're about 25 minutes into totality uh, we're looking at a big beautiful red moon there from tucson arizona from our time and date mobile observatory and then we're looking at a beautiful big yellow moon there depending on the filter that's being used on the moon from tucson arizona as well i think that's our solar camera being used on the moon there um so two feeds from our mobile observatory and then we've got uh, quite dim and dark feed from New York uh, from our friend Kat Pro. She's in Long Island City in New York and she's looking across the East River towards Manhattan. And we're trying to, we're waiting for the moon to kind of set behind the New York skyline, maybe even the Empire State Building there. So that's why we're looking at that black blackness there. But the full moon is a beautiful deep red color at the moment. And uh, it's much fainter than a normal full moon. We've got the light being filtered and it making it really red. And that makes it easy, like we're looking here at the screen from Mauna Kea Y from the Subaru Asahi Star Camera. And because the moon is faint, you know, earlier when we were looking at the images from here, it was really, really bright and it was washing out the rest of the sky. But now we actually can see some interesting things in the image there. And what are we looking at? Graham. Right. Ad astronomers always have this kind of love-hate relationship <laughs> with the full moon yeah. because the full moon is spectacular to observe and look at, but also it is normally so bright that it can just wash out the sky and make seeing other interesting objects in the sky extremely difficult. Mm. Uh, but as you said, Anna, during totality, the moon is much fainter and it does mean that one of the one of the hidden delights of a total lunar eclipse is that during totality the the stars appear to come out in the sky and we do have a, a spectacular view of that here from the top of the Mauna Kea volcano mm. in Hawaii coming from our friends Ichi Tanaka and his team at the Subaru Asahi star camera. Uh, this is a camera that is pointing um, pretty much uh, straight up at the moment. Um, here in, in Hawaii, uh, the local time there, it's, well, it's coming up to one o'clock in the morning. Uh, the moon is, uh, is, is, is pretty much directly overhead. It's actually about 80 degrees altitude, which means it is almost almost 90 degrees which is exactly overhead and we can see the beautiful starry background of the sky there um we can see the 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 the, uh, the pleiades star cluster um uh, there towards the the top left side of the moon and um yes the starry sky is mm. is one of the great delights mm. of a total lunar eclipse there are other interesting objects yeah. in the sky at the moment. Um, one of these uh, is uh, is the planet Uranus, yeah. uh, which reaches opposition tomorrow. Um, opposition is when a planet is directly opposite the sun in the Earth's sky. And it's normally the best time to observe the planet. It's normally at its brightest. Um, now, Uranus is generally something you need a telescope yeah. or binoculars to see, but around the time of opposition, it is possible to see it with the naked eye. Generally, we can't see it tonight because of that big, bright full moon. Mm. The moon is also at opposition tonight. It's also directly mm. opposite the sun <laughs> in the Earth's sky. So the full moon and Uranus are extremely close mm. in the sky. But as the moon gets fainter uh, and dimmer uh, during totality, it does become possible uh, with a telescope to pick out Uranus in the night sky there uh, next to the moon. In fact, in some parts of the world, tonight, um, the moon does actually pass in front of Uranus. Yeah. Uh, there is an occultation 
of the planet, in some parts of Asia and Alaska. Um, and for the rest of the world, um, yes, Uranus is there, uh, just really right next to the moon in the sky. Yep. Um, other interesting objects in the sky tonight, um, the planet Mars. Yep. Um, Mars has its opposition next month on December the 8th. That's when Mars will be lying directly opposite the sun in our sky. That's when Mars is at its brightest and fieriest and, and reddest. Mm. Um, and Mars, if, if you're outside tonight looking up um, and if you see a bright uh, reddish mm. star, that will almost that certainly be Mars, be Mars mm. in the sky. Of course, all of these objects you can find on our night sky map um, mm. where you can where you can search for different planets mm. in the sky um, at different times on different dates um, and uh, yes that's all there at our night sky map on timeanddate.com and you can find that you can find our night sky map on timeanddate.com you can go to timeanddate.live for more info pictures tweets background information um, Click subscribe so that you won't miss out on future live streams and stay tuned because we are going to be back with more.
Welcome back. We're watching a lunar eclipse on time and date. The moon is moving through the Earth's shadow in space. And uh, right now, we are in the total phase of this eclipse. The moon is completely within the Earth's dark umbral shadow, and it's taken on this reddish color. Totality during tonight's eclipse lasts for one hour, 25 minutes, and we are just over halfway through that period. Yep. Um, it is, it's what, it's 11.04 UTC. Uh, we have our UTC clock in the bottom right-hand corner. Oh, we've got our the timeline screen. there on the side showing us exactly where we are in the eclipse. Exactly, and we can see from the timeline that we are just past maximum eclipse uh that that is the point where the moon is 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 at its deepest point into the earth's shadow that's when the moon is at its faintest and at its reddest um so now for the for the rest of the eclipse the moon is going to be slowly moving out of the earth's shadow we still have about 35 minutes of totality to run we still have the second partial phase mm. of the eclipse to come that's when uh everything happens in reverse compared to what we saw earlier at the beginning of mm. the eclipse we saw the earth's dark shadow eating into the the face of the moon during that second partial phase we will see the earth's dark shadow slowly uncovering the moon um, at the moment on the screen, we have uh, feeds uh, in the in the on the right hand side. We have our two feeds from Hawaii, mm. from uh, from Waimea, from the Starry Nights in Waimea, and uh, below them from the Subaru Asahi Star Camera at the top of Mauna Kea. We have that great sky view taken from next door to the Subaru Telescope, and Anna on. Our main feed on the big screen, we have the, the pictures coming in from the Time and Date Mobile Observatory in Tucson, Arizona. Tucson, Arizona. And we had practiced, practice, practice that they were going to be in Roswell, New Mexico. And we thought we had a solar eclipse a couple of weeks ago and it was hectic. And we thought this was going to be a quiet one. New Mexico is dry. It's, it's non-cloudy. But Mobile Observatory, our colleagues Constantine Picos and Stefan Torsen had to put their skates on, get in the car and travel eight hours, nine hours, I'm not sure. It was a long drive west to Arizona to get clear skies. And um, I've been hearing here in the break, they've been running on adrenaline and energy drinks because they haven't been getting a lot of sleep between the jet lag and they're getting ready for this eclipse. So we're going to bring on our colleague Constantine Bikos onto the screen now. And there he is. Hi, Hello. Constantine. How are you? Hi, Anna and Graham. Nice to see you. I'm <laughs> nice live to see from you. Tucson, Arizona. Tired, <laughs> cold, haven't had a shower in ages, but enjoying the show. This is so much fun. And how and you know we know you ended up in tucson arizona but how did you choose why how did you end up there we have been looking at weather projections uh for days every minute of every day uh in the last few days uh <laughs> trying to find that sliver of uh of blue skies that you know you can kind of rely on and southern arizona uh in the last few days got more and more secure, uh, the, the most secure location for us to be, uh, to film, to bring you these nice, clear images without clouds. <laughs> so yep. Yep. there was no option, unfortunately, to stay in, in Roswell. We're li really sad about this. I mean, it's fantastic and beautiful here in Tucson, but we wanted to be in Roswell with our friends from the Roswell Astronomy Club. But just goes to show nature does its own thing and sent us clouds so we couldn't stay there unfortunately 
And you've been literally chasing the eclipse. And tell us a little bit about your adventures over the past couple of days. Been, we've been reading a little bit about it on our live news feed on Time and Dead Live. But tell us a little bit about what you guys have been up to since you left HQ in Stavanger, Norway. Yes. Well, it's been uh, what a trip it's been. Uh, we have traveled across the Atlantic Ocean and uh, many hours in a plane and many hours in a car uh, across the prairies of uh, eastern New Mexico. It's beautiful there and the, you feel alone with the sky. It's beautiful. Uh, and uh, we we got to Roswell and got to meet the lovely folks at the um, Roswell Astronomy Club and uh, their president, Peggy Bolin, uh, whom you I think you will also interview later in the show um and uh who has been such great help uh setting up everything in roswell and unfortunately we couldn't stay there um <laughs> and uh, yesterday we got up at four o'clock and started driving westward to arizona and um it was uh, quite a trip what can i say <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that, that is that is quite an eclipse chasing adventure um, you've had. Um, uh, so Constantine, um, I mean, it's now what it's 10 past four in the morning in Tucson. So we are heading towards the end of the night and sunrise and the moon is going to be uh, setting. I think we're going to be losing the moon there round about the end of the partial phase of this eclipse yes, correct um how is the, how is the sky looking now uh sort of between the moon and the horizon where it's going to be setting is, is is it all clear skies all the way down is there any cloud lurking it's uh the the weather forecasts were right so uh, at least we got that one uh, right uh, in the bag <laughs> so yes the, the skies are clear it's looking perfect excellent great so we will be enjoying uh yeah. your your stream from tucson um right the way through to the end of the partial phase of the eclipse oh, yeah. very happy about Wonderful. that and if you're interested in more go to timeofday.live there you can read about constantine and stefan's adventures and we will be back here with this beautiful moon from tucson arizona soon
You're watching a total lunar eclipse on time and day. And we've got another 20 minutes of left of totality. The moon is looking still very big, beautiful and pink there. In New York, the moon has disappeared behind the buildings. It will be setting in Tucson around the end of partial. So we still have beautiful images to go there. In Hawaii, it's still nicely overhead. We can see that up there in the corner in Waimea. It's hanging out there beautifully pink and then in Mauna Kea there as well you can see it right on the edge of the dome of the Subaru telescope there in Perth the moon is still hiding behind some clouds we're waiting for it to rise above them so we can show you some images of the moon there we've got a red moon we've got a yellow moon we've got a pink moon and it all looks a bit funny and why is that Graham right we've seen some very different uh views of the moon during our live stream tonight um yes firstly as you say we've seen some very different colors mm. and shadings of the moon um one reason for this is that different setups have different filters and different settings and they all kind of capture slightly different shades of color of the moon um right there from 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 tucson arizona 
um, on, a, on our main screen, we have that very sort of pinkish, mm. um, totally eclipsed moon looking a lot yellower <laughs> through the view from our other telescope mm. that we have set up. Of course, the interesting question is, what does it look like in with the, the naked eye mm. in the sky? Mm. And uh, what we're hearing from Stefan and Constantine on the ground in Tucson is that the naked eye view of totality is somewhere closer to the yellowish moon. Hmm. Um, so, uh, so maybe between the red and the yellow color, something like an orange yeah. color. Um, it's actually very difficult to, to capture that naked eye mm. uh, shading of the moon with telescopes and, uh, and cameras. So uh, yes, that's why we're looking at different colors yeah. of the moons. We're also looking um, at different orientations yeah. of the moon. Um, if we look at the moon in the top right corner from Waimea in Hawaii, we can see that the orientation there is not quite the same as the moon we're looking at from Tucson, Arizona. Mm. Uh, now, this, uh, this, this difference uh, is all down to what time of night yeah. uh, we are looking at this moon. So in Tucson, Arizona, as you said, Anna, we're heading towards moonset mm. we're heading towards the end of the night and the moon is edging down towards the horizon um in waimea we are still in the middle of the night and the moon is still overhead mm. now this makes a difference to the orientation because as the moon moves across the sky it appears to rotate yeah if you can imagine a, a speeded up night where you watch the moon, the full moon rise uh, over the eastern horizon, move across the sky, pass above you, and then set beneath the western horizon. Uh, in that speeded up view, you would see the moon appear to rotate as it moves across the sky. You say appear. Right. Because it's not really the moon that's rotating in the sky. It's, it's actually uh, us. Mm rotating <laughs> on the earth if you can imagine uh you know we watch it rise in the east and set in the west in between those two events we have to turn around mm. so we can watch it uh over the opposite horizon and when we're when we turn around that that is you know we are effectively rotating so mm. this rotation of the moon it's actually the observer rotating rather than the moon but that's another difference that we're seeing mm. um, in these feeds from different parts of the globe yeah oh and we've got some images coming in there from perth we've got quite a bit of cloud covering but that that's definitely a blood red moon behind there. There is, yeah. So here we are then. Um, well, it's still fairly soon after moonrise mm. in Perth. So the moon is very low down. There's a lot of atmosphere mm. that we have to see through mm. uh, to get to the moon. Also, of course, the moon is, as we've been talking about, very faint mm. uh, because it is covered mm. by Earth's shadow. Mm. So uh, yes, we are getting some pictures there of a very faint moon, very low in the sky, close to the horizon, through that cloudy sky. And uh, yes, that's great to see from, from the team at Perth Observatory. And oh, we're gonna leave you here with these beautiful images from Tucson, Waimea and Perth, Australia. Uh, make sure to check out timeanddeck.live for more info about the science of lunar eclipses. And uh, we'll see you back here soon.
you're watching a total lunar eclipse here with us at timeanddate.com headquarters in Stavanger, Norway. Now we're looking at some beautiful images from across the globe. We've got Perth all the way in Western Australia and then in the middle there in the Pacific we've got uh, Waimea, Hawaii, that's the starry nights helping us out there. And we've got Tucson, Arizona, our mobile observatory there showing us a bright yellow image of the moon. And we know that that's got to do with filters and all kinds of stuff. And maybe Perth's got it right. They were talking about an orangey mid yellow color of the moon. Maybe they're the closest to what you can see with the naked eye. We're not, it's hard to know, but finally Perth Observatory the moon has risen and is above the clouds and above the atmosphere and we're getting some gorgeous gorgeous images of a totally eclipsed moon there but we can see that totality is ending pretty much right about now if we're looking at UTC time there and looking at the at our timeline there on the side and you can see right at the bottom there on Perth's image of the moon there that is getting a little bit brighter, a little bit whiter there. So uh, we're going towards the end of totality, but we still have the second partial phase to enjoy. That's the phase where the moon's shadow recedes, where everything happens in reverse and the moon shadows, moon's shadow recedes from the surface, the Earth's shadow, not the moon's shadow. You have to correct me when I say things wrong it's looking big it's looking beautiful and graham's going to give us some science about this well as you say anna yes the moon is is looking beautiful and enormous uh, on our screen here and in a lot of the photos on our live blog uh the moon is is is, is looking huge in the sky in many of the photos um of course when we actually step outside and see it in the sky the moon is uh, actually rather small mm. in the sky. Mm. Um, it has an angular diameter of about half a degree. <laughs> um, now, how big is that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, the half a degree as a, as a, as a guide, um, if you take your, your little finger and you hold it at arm's length, uh, the width of your little finger is about one degree so the Half width that. yeah held held at arm's length is the is the rough guide so uh the width of the full moon is about half the width of your little finger held at arm's length which is also about the size of the sun hmm. in the sky um the moon and the sun uh, have an almost identical size in the sky hmm. this is something of course we really see during solar eclipses yeah. we're going to be talking about solar eclipses that are coming up later in the show and during a solar eclipse we can really see there that the sun and the moon um, have pretty much the same diameter um, in the sky that raises an interesting question okay um, if the sun and the moon appear to be uh, the same size in the sky that means that we can say that if the sun is x times bigger than the moon in real life yeah. then it must also be x times further away yeah so that when we see them in the sky they appear to be the same apparent size mm. so then the question is what number is x how much bigger is the sun mm. than the moon and, and how much further away is the sun uh, than the moon uh, our early astronomers um, had a go at working this out and they came up with a number of about 19 <laughs> one nine um, they thought the sun was about, round and nice number right about yeah. 19 times bigger mm. than the moon and about 19 times further away and that seemed that kind of feels like a reasonable number mm. But in fact, we we now know that the number is much bigger than that. The actual number is about 400. Yeah. The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon and it's 400 times further away. And that then becomes a rather remarkable coincidence. Oh, perfect coincidence there right and the, like a perfect coincidence like the sun and the moon are so different in size but when we see them in the sky they are almost the same size mm. i mean if we if we think about it 
You know, if the moon was the size of a grape, 400 times bigger, the sun would be the size of a three story building. Wow. And yet, when we see them in the sky from Earth, they appear to be exactly the same size. That is, uh, that is, it's a, a little bit of a, yeah, that is a, a remarkable coincidence. That is a little bit of a brain explosion situation <laughs> going there. So please keep watching. We've got totality has ended, but I think the moons are looking fairly beautiful and colored still pink, purple, orangey neon they're looking really beautiful there and we still have an hour of the second partial phase to go and we're looking at these great pictures that some of them are from the time and date mobile observatory and two weeks ago our ceo stefan was in the arctic filming a partial solar eclipse with our colleague adelbert and today he's traveled to the u.s desert with our colleague constantine that we met just few minutes ago or half an hour ago or so um now we also want to give a mention to all the wonderful people that are working behind the scenes you see us here on the screen but we've got people in our air we've got people in the next rooms doing huge job jobs and the person that's running the amazing live news feed at on time and date live that's our partner helping the conversation on social media is matthew kobe and Ina Maria, uh, managing everything in the control room. We have Gustav, Jason, Andy, and Anya, and finally, and not, not the least, uh, we have our special mention to our designer, Ingvall. She's been producing the graphics and on-screen info for these shows since the start, and she's been kept playing a key role in emotional support and design. <laughs> And she's leaving time and date at the end of the year. Thank you, Ingi. We love you. Best wishes from all of us. So go to timeanddate.live. That's where you see all the busy bees working away. And you can find our live news feed, updates on the eclipse, our partners, pictures, lots more. And we will see you back here very soon.
you're watching a total lunar eclipse with time and date here from the time and date headquarters in Stavanger, Norway. We've got about 50 minutes to go of the second partial phase. Earth's dark shadow is moving away from the face of the moon. Um, looking down at the clock there, 12.01 UTC and looking over at our timeline there, um, where we're seeing that we're at the, end, at the end of totality. We're actually quite into the partial third, into the second partial phase there but we've still got plenty of action going on in the sky still. So don't go away. This is the last lunar eclipse until 2025, but we've had some, I have some amazing solar eclipses coming up. We've been talking to Matt about the eclipse coming up in Australia in April. And then we're going to be talking to Peggy Bolen from the Roswell Astronomy Club later on, interviewing her later on in the show. And yeah, Graham, there's some exciting stuff still happening in the sky. There is. Um, Anna, the, the 2020s are something of a golden decade for solar eclipses. Mm. And we have two very exciting solar eclipses coming up next year, 2023. Yeah. We have a total solar eclipse that is uh, crossing a, a small part of Western Australia. And we have an annular solar eclipse that will be passing across North America and South America. We can take a very quick look um, at, at a map mm. for these eclipses. We can we can bring up here. Um, this is uh, this is the map uh, for the Australia mm. total solar eclipse. This is April twentieth, twenty twenty three. Here we see Australia, and on the left hand side of the map we see that very very narrow reddish pinkish path. This is the path of totality. You need to be somewhere in that very small strip to see the moon completely cover the face of the sun. Mm. And the, the remarkable thing about this eclipse is that that path of totality, it starts off uh, across the uh, Indian Ocean, but it just clips uh, a peninsula, a small peninsula of Western Australia. Mm. Um, this is the Northwest Cape. And uh, uh, this, this, uh, this very narrow path just clips this, this small uh, peninsula. And it means we will have about one minute of totality mm. there on the Northwest Cape. We will be there. We are teaming up with Matt what? at Perth Observatory and um, our, our very own Stefan Torsen will be there um, with with his telescopes um, and this is coming up on April the 20th 2023 six months later yep uh, we have an annular solar hmm. eclipse now an annular solar eclipse happens when the moon is a bit further away and is a bit smaller in the sky so it doesn't quite cover the Sun completely no. uh, instead um, it gets silhouetted against the sun and we have the effect of a of a very narrow ring of fire yeah. in the sky um just as we looked at the path of totality for the australian total eclipse we can have a look at the path of annularity uh, for the annular eclipse and uh, we can bring that up here um so this pink path that's going across the southwestern corner of the United States. Uh, this is where you can see annularity, this ring of fire mm. in the sky. Um, it comes in from the Pacific. Um, it crosses the US from Oregon to Texas. It then goes out into the Gulf of Mexico um, and then through Central America, Colombia, Brazil, ends up in the Atlantic Ocean. One thing we should say on our maps here, Anna, is that we've also got some uh, some cloud yeah. coverage yeah. Yeah. on I here. See the dirty bits of cloud. That's right. Yeah. So this is uh, this is using our cloud tool. It's based on satellite data for the past mm -hmm. twenty years, and it shows the average cloud cover around October fourteenth, yeah. which is the date of the annular eclipse. And we can see that, uh, you know, there is a lot of cloud generally over the eastern half 
of the United States, but that southwestern yeah. corner of the United States is, uh, uh, you know, uh, historically around October 14th, it's, uh, it's generally looking cloud good. free. It's looking good. Yeah. Um, so, of course, you know, fingers crossed um, for clear skies on October 14th for that annular solar eclipse. And uh, again, we'll be covering that live. And uh, for that, our mobile observatory will be in Roswell, New Mexico. So make sure you hit subscribe on our YouTube channel so you don't miss it. Make sure to check us out on timeofdead.live. But we've also, I want to recap, we've got this total solar eclipse coming up in Australia in April 2023. In October, we've got a second solar eclipse and it's in the world famous city of Roswell, New Mexico. And then we've got a little alien pointing there at the ring of fire. And that's why we're going to be talking to Peggy Bolin next. She's the president of the Roswell Astronomy Club. And she's the reason we were in Roswell for the lunar eclipse as well, but had to find the clear skies. And we're crossing our fingers still for clear skies in 2023. And it looks like that on the map so take a look at time of live while you're in there click subscribe make sure you don't miss out on our future live shows and we're going to be back talking to peggy at five o'clock in the morning in roswell
you're watching timeanddate.com we're streaming this total lunar eclipse from across the globe the moon has already set in new york we can't see it here on our screen we've got two moons there going from tucson arizona the moon will set near the end of partial there but it has just risen or almost just risen in perth in western australia they've got some beautiful clouds going across there from uh, footage from perth observatory but they're not at the observatory they're on the beach and looking at that beautiful eclipsed moon um so we've got a lot of things happening on the screen here and there's about to be more we've managed to catch up with peggy bolin she's the president of the roswell astronomy club and our mobile observatory we've you know they're, they're streaming from Tucson obviously but they were supposed to join her in Roswell so Peggy commiserations on the weather oh, <laughs> how no. are you where are you nope I woke up at four o'clock this morning cloud cover 100 percent I'm like shoot <laughs> and you're in the right place for clear skies but where are you right now you, you obviously you're not on a rooftop in downtown roswell. no 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 i'm sitting in my family room in the west part of roswell so i stepped outside still cloud covered i'm like darn it so yeah <laughs> I didn't and it's go very early morning for you there yeah yeah it's what 5 30 ish for you in the morning 5 20 yes. i guess it is local time so yeah so early early so thank you for getting up and talking to us anyways yeah thanks thanks for getting up peggy and uh yeah we're just we're just we're so disappointed that our mobile observatory team is not there with you on a rooftop in downtown roswell at the moment um but uh we know that uh stefan and constantine spent the weekend with you there. Um, uh, you were doing some looking ahead to the solar eclipse next year, and they were meeting some of the Roswell Astronomy Club as well. And um, yes, how was how was the weekend with uh, with the Mobile Observatory team? Oh, they're wonderful people. We had so much fun. <laughs> we went, you know, we went out to lunch together, and then they came over to my house for dinner. Oh, and nice. then we went out to dinner the following evening. And so we had good connections with them. And we talked a lot about next year, which is great. So we're getting some yeah. plans for next year. Yeah, excellent. And, uh, and we're definitely excited about collaborating with you again next year. Um, Peggy, could you tell us a little about the Roswell Astronomy Club? Sure. The Roswell Astronomy Club has been around for over 50 years, and we have over 30 members. It's a nice sized group. Um, we are pretty active in the community. When there's events, we go like we had the Dragonfly Festival. We had um, a table there at the Science and Art Festival in Roswell. We had a table there. So we're trying to get out to the public and get them to understand about the a that there is a club. Roswell Astronomy Club, mm -hmm. and that we do moon gazes and star parties and and other things, so that the you know people can can see the moon through the telescope, can see Saturn and Jupiter and some other celestial beings through our bodies, not beings <laughs> uh, through the <laughs> telescope. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so yeah, it, it's yeah, it's a good club. I mean, and we've got some real good active members, and so it's nice. They're good people. Yeah, it sounds terrific. It sounds terrific. And um, hey, so we, we're just under a year to go until this big annular solar eclipse. Um, we were looking at a map earlier, and uh, the path of annularity crosses the southwestern corner of the United States from Oregon down through Texas. Um, Peggy, for, for anyone that's starting to think ahead and plan ahead and is looking at a map and thinking where to go for this eclipse, um, you know, why, why is Roswell a good place to come for next year's eclipse? Well, it's not a huge city. 
like Dallas or Albuquerque. It's not a teeny, teeny town. We have a mm -hmm. lot to offer being a city of about 50,000 people. We have good hotels. We have great restaurants. Um, there's a lot to see in the Southeast area in New Mexico that people don't realize. Carlsbad Caverns, for one, is one of the national parks. Uh, we have Bonamos Lakes, Bitter Lake National Refuge. Um, hey, we have aliens here. We have UFOs. I mean, there is <laughs> our downtown is so quirky and adorable. Um, the, the UFO Museum. We our McDonald's is in the shape of a of a space a spaceship. I mean, we have all these. If you like aliens, this is the place to go if you're going to see something cool, but you know, fantastic having to do with a solar eclipse. So Russell's a, <laughs> a nice place to be. And plus, hopefully, we'll have clear skies. I mean, we're, we normally do. So this is like a weird thing, having cloud cover like this. <laughs> so don't don't be afraid. And plus, one, one thing that, that people, um, you know, outsiders, if you're trying to book a room right now for this annual or solar eclipse, a lot of hotels in Roswell have not heard or probably aren't aware that we're going to have people showing up here. And so they might not have <laughs> done anything with the prices of the hotel yet, as some, <laughs> you know, some places do. So, you know, it could be a good thing to get your, get your hotel room now. And then instead of waiting till March or <laughs> September, September would be bad probably because by then, hopefully the public will know yeah yeah excellent and and hopefully we've got the bad luck with the clouds out of the bad way luck. with this eclipse exactly. and so at the next eclipse we'll be back to the famously clear skies of new mexico and the southwest and uh... you've got me really excited yes. peggy to, to come to to roswell next year and uh hopefully we will be there yeah uh, absolutely. that's the plan uh, we're nearing the end of this eclipse We've still got the end of the partial phase to enjoy. So stay with us. Check out timeanddate.live for updates of other clips. And thank you, Peggy, for joining us. And we will be back. You bet.
you've been watching a total lunar eclipse here on timeanddate.com the partial phase is ending about now we've got three telescope feeds still going strong we know that the sun has just risen in no, the sun the moon has just risen in perth australia in hawaii in waimea it's still pretty much overhead and in tucson arizona we can see that the image is kind of warbly there it means that the moon is quite low in the sky it's going through quite some has to go through some thick horizon there some thick atmosphere on the horizon and we've got i don't think it's clouds i think it's trees cactuses i think that's what stefan told us in the break so that's starting to cover up the moon there as it's setting in tucson Arizona. There's always something interesting in the sky. So keep an eye on our social media channels, our news articles, and our night sky map is a really great tool to go in and look at planets, look at the moon, look at the sun, and look at the position in relation to each other. So uh, there's a lot of fun going on in the sky. As you say, Anna, there's always something interesting uh, in the sky. Um, back in September, uh, Time and Date was at the Europlanet Science Congress, um, which is a, it's a big annual get-together of planetary scientists and astronomers and science communicators. Um, we were chairing a session on astronomy outreach and using live broadcasts like of things one. like eclipses, yeah, yeah. To, 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 to do outreach um, to the public. Um, we also um, did a, a small presentation on some of the astronomy highlights coming up um, throughout the, the 2020s and 2030s, over the next 20 years or so. Um, we were looking at um, notable eclipses that were coming up and also um, some notable uh, conjunctions and close approaches where planets appear to get close together in the sky. Um, and by the way, on the screen there, <laughs> that is definitely, that definitely looks like uh, the moon setting behind some trees yeah. uh, there in, uh, in Tucson. Some That's, beautiful leaves going on there. That is, wow, that is quite a, that is quite a spectacular moon set. Interrupted by the moon. In uh, absolute, yes, yes. Um, yes, we were talking about close approaches of yeah. planets um and uh yes we were highlighting some of the forthcoming closest approaches one of them uh is happening very soon mm. in january um uh in fact on january 22nd next year there is a close approach between venus and saturn in the early evening sky mm. and um i think we can just very quickly bring up an image from our night sky map which uh, which is showing the view from New York on the evening of January 22nd. Um, this is at 1730 local time. We can see a very thin crescent moon uh, just about to set. And above that, there is that very bright star. That in, right, that in fact is not a bright star. That in fact is two planets very close together. That is Venus and Saturn. They will be separated by just one third of a degree in the sky, which is, which is extremely close. How did you do it with your little finger? Right, so one degree is kind of the width of your little finger at arm's length. So one third of the width of your little finger at arm's length will be the distance between uh, Venus and Saturn in the sky. Um, yes, we have, as you say, there's always something mm. interesting happening. So um, yes, it's good to keep an eye on our social media channels, on our news pages, and on our website for everything that's happening in astronomy. But unfortunately, we're nearing the end of this eclipse and what an eclipse it has been. And we owe it to our beautiful and very talented partners that we've been working with several times now. So in Hawaii, We've got Ichi Tanaka and his team at the Subaru Asahi Star Camera. They're the ones that gave us that beautiful wide angle of the sky with the dome there on the side. Also in Hawaii, the starry nights. And we're all still looking at images of the moon from Waimea, 
Hawaii. That's Preeti, Krishnamurti and Avinash surrendering there. In Perth, we, we were talking to Matt. He's our favourite Australian. He was with Perth Observatory. I think, yep, we got the moon up there right in time. In New York, Kat Troche from the Amateur Astronomers Association was streaming us images of the moon there. And the moon has set in New York. Alas, in San Diego, Dave Decker and Gary Hawkins, their fifth time working with us, they had to just give it up. San Diego Astronomy Association did not, Association did not have any good luck with the clouds this year. Peggy Boleyn, we just talked to her and her colleagues. Roswell Astronomy Club have been really helpful making Stefan Thompson and Constantine because very, very comfortable and happy there in Roswell, Australia. And there they are in Tucson, Arizona. We see the uh, moon is <laughs> covered by leaves there. <laughs> they can finally, finally get some rest. So thank you so much to Constantine Bikos and Stefan Torson at the Time and Date Marble Observatory in Arizona. As always, check out our news feed on timeanddepth.live. We've put all kinds of resources there, links to our astronomy tools, our night sky map, all the thing, all the good things that we do here at Time and Date. And make sure to subscribe to YouTube. We've got um, solar eclipses coming out of our ears next year, so uh, we're excited about that. We're going to leave you with these gorgeous pictures on the screen. But from me, Anna Buckle and Graham Jones, we'll see you in April.
time and date, we look up into the sky. We bring you exclusive footage from eclipses worldwide. We take our mobile observatory to where the action happens. Hi Stefan. Hi Anna. We collaborate with experts and observatories across the globe to bring you the best view of celestial events. And we ordered the devil's horn just for you. Now, we have to say thank you very much for your images tonight. We explain how and show why it all happens while answering your questions during our live broadcast events. That is a, a meteor. Find your home and even more details on time and day. And subscribe to join us next time.